Hey everyone, welcome to Blockchain and the Law. I'm your host from Inside.com, Stephanie Zielinski. Today, we are going to discuss the current state of blockchain technology, its promises for the future, and the many legal considerations that founders, investors, and users should be aware of as this technology becomes more mainstream. All of our three guests today are lawyers with immense ex expertise in tech. We are going to hear from Liam Gill, former CEO of Fumari Technology and founder of lawforstartups.com, Tony Tai, CEO and chief engineer at Hyperdraft Inc., and Brian Brooks, CEO at Bitfury Group, former US CEO at Binance, and former US acting comptroller of the currency. Our discussion today is going to include topics around investments and law. So here's the disclaimer. Inside.com is providing all this information for educational purposes only. It is not intended to be investment or legal advice. Please consult licensed counsel who's familiar with your personal situation before participating in the industries that we'll discuss here today. All right, a little about Inside.com real quick. We are always here to make you smarter and more successful. We do this through news, events, and community. We've got over 14 newsletters that cover the worlds of business, tech, VC, crypto, and more. We host free events like this every week. In fact, this is a jam-packed week for our events. We have a lot going on. At every event, you are going to hear from the people who are building the worlds of tomorrow and dis discover exclusive insights and trends from industry experts. Finally, we just launched a beta social news site for professionals. Um, that's really going to help build your network and community. Check it out at inside.com. Let's interact, everyone. Please introduce yourself. Tell us who you are, what you do, where you're tuning in from, and please bring us your questions for Liam, Tony, and Brian. Whether you're watching on YouTube or Twitter um, or LinkedIn, go to the comment section now and give us your questions surrounding blockchain and the law. All right, it is about time for a little overview of our topic. We are going to hear from Liam Gill. He has extensive experience with high growth technologies uh, and the legal field. He holds a law degree, a master of laws and master of sciences. He's the former founder and CEO of Fumari Technology, a top ranked distributed cloud computing tech company. Today, he focuses his time, efforts, and capital on supporting founders. He is our former managing editor at Inside.com and now part-time contributor. He founded LawForStartups.com with over 30,000 founders subscribed today. And at Zargar Lawyers in Vancouver, he focuses his legal practice on small business mergers and acquisitions, and he supports high-growth tech companies from incorporation through to IPO. Hey, Liam, welcome. Hey, Stephanie, thanks for the intro. And uh, shout out to Crew for that incredible graphic at the beginning that was uh, very entertaining. <laughs> all right, Liam, we're excited to um, hear this broad overview of all that's going on with blockchain in the law right now. Yeah, looking forward to it. Uh, yeah, we'll start with the slides. So I hope that people who have joined us today have had a chance to read some of the content that I've contributed to Inside Cryptocurrency in the past few weeks. This has been like a high level overview of what I'm going to talk about and what uh, should set really the baseline of your knowledge moving into this. Uh, just in case you haven't had a chance to read through those, I'm going to very briefly in about 15 minutes go through what you should probably know and how you should contextualize the conversation we're going to have over the next hour, hour and a half. Just to be clear, uh, there isn't much space in terms of time for me to explain everything and to explain, you know, what blockchain is, what all the legal regulations are, et cetera. So I'm going to focus on three main takeaways or three main concepts that I think you should use to contextualize your understanding or approach to the topic of blockchain and the law. And those are innovation, integration, and security. So I'll repeat it again, because I, I really think these are words people need to remember. So it's innovation, integration, security. So what do I mean by those? By innovation, I mean, how do we regulate a new technology without prohibiting innovation or stalling innovation? I think that's a very important thing here. We've seen a lot of companies who were potentially over-regulated in 2017, moving out of the US and founding companies in Europe or in Canada. So how do we 
regulate this space without stopping innovation from occurring within the United States for the purposes of this context, but potentially, you know, when we're talking about the EU or Canada, uh, without stopping innovation in the Western world as a whole. Integration is about whether or not this technology can be integrated into the existing law. So can we take something like Bitcoin and determine how it fits into the laws that were written all the way back in the early 1900s, all the way to today? Or do we need to actually create new laws specific to blockchain technology, to Bitcoin, uh, to NFTs, to whatever it is? Do we need new regulations or can we find a way of integrating them into existing ones? And security is how do we regulate while protecting people and while protecting national security? All three of these topics are very interrelated, but I think this is a good way of approaching this topic, whether you're a founder who wants to you know, start a company in this area and you're wondering how the regulators or how policymakers might go about enforcing or creating laws and regulations, whether you're an investor wondering you know, how you should go about allocating your capital, uh, really taking, taking these job. three things and focusing on these three uh, topics is going to be very important. So as I said, we don't really have a lot of time. So I want to focus specifically on talking within these six sort of industries, so to speak. And these are the six that are likely being the most affected in the short term by blockchain technology or distributed ledger technology. Uh, capital markets, we've obviously seen that's cryptocurrencies, ICOs, payments is stable coins, uh, central bank digital currencies. Identity is having some way of using private keys to identify individuals. Records of ownership is along the lines of the Oracle problem or you know, finding a way of using blockchain to know who does and does not own something. And then digital commodities are where you get into NFTs. Uh, and all of this together is what really builds uh, the metaverse or Web3 where people can really own digital online assets. So looking at innovation, this idea of how do we regulate without stalling innovation? There's really three main areas that stand out to me as good, good examples of why this is an important question to ask. ICOs are revolutionary. They're a way for anybody to come up with an idea, get a website, and instantly be selling a product. You can instantly sell your tokens, which can be used if they're utility tokens to later redeem the software you're developing or the you know, participate in the ecosystem that you're building. They could be potentially shares in the company. They can be anything. And any founder could just create these instantly and sell them online. This is a great way of encouraging innovation, encouraging new companies, distributing capital in an economy, in a world where we've often seen inequality in access to capital. This is a great way of getting rid of these problems and helping people to innovate. On the flip side, we have the idea of you know securities law. We have a lot of traditional problems that we've seen with you know accredited investor requirements, and these will limit the the ability for ICOs to function. So nowadays, if you want to have an ICO, you still have to do it within the regulatory framework of securities law. So there's a real question here about: Do we want to potentially open up avenues to have ICOs and to leverage the ability and technology that ICOs bring about to allocate capital potentially more efficiently? Uh, and does that offset the potential harms that there could be from anyone being able to go on a website and instantly invest in a brand new idea? NFTs are the same. You know, is there a way of regulating NFTs in a way that doesn't limit the market? Do we want to be able to have people spending $300,000 on a JPEG of an ape? Is that something that we want in society? But, or is that something that we want to regulate? But at the same time, you got to consider... You know, NFTs in their current form are, are very much stage one. The, the industry is going to grow. They're going to have much more practical applications. I know some people won't like that term practical, but, you know, they'll have applications that will affect day-to-day -day life. Uh, there will come a point where even the most skeptical person will have to own an NFT, whether it's to go to an NBA game or potentially to own a house. Like these are going to be things that become more common and is a technology that we do need to grow. Stable coins are the same. We've heard a lot from the Treasury Secretary about her dislike, so to speak, or concerns around stable coins and how they could potentially trick people into believing that they're investing in a safe asset 
when in reality those assets are less secure than they might think. But again, stablecoins solve the real problem. They have all the benefits of cryptocurrencies being that they're instantaneously transferable. They can transfer across borders with little cost uh, while also having stability. So they don't, they're not as volatile as Ethereum or Bitcoin. So there's a real innovation there. But what is the you know, policy concern? What is the legal concern? And how do we balance those two? And how do poly- policymakers go about creating laws without stifling that innovation? When you talk about integration, another three areas that come to mind, cryptocurrencies again, uh, there's this idea of, of, of transition in a cryptocurrency. You know, in, historically, we've kind of categorized assets uh, into three classes, whether that be securities, commodities, or money. And you've had either securities law, commodities law, or anti-money laundering legislation. And cryptocurrencies kind of blur the lines. So when you see something like Bitcoin, a lot of people talk about it as digital gold. So you would kind of think maybe it's a commodity, but at the same time, it's used quite a bit for currency transactions, especially in larger denominations. So it could potentially fall under you know, some sort of money. Uh, when you see certain cryptocurrencies, for example, I'm invested in a currency called Render. Uh, and what their currency does is it allows you to access uh, cloud computing power. So they take what AWS has and they distribute it across a whole network. So gamers essentially provide the cloud computing power and you pay them in this coin. That sounds a lot more to me like some sort of commodity where you're accessing computing power for this ter- token. Or the reason I'm personally invested isn't to actually buy computing power, but it's because I think the company is going to grow and the value will go up, which sounds a lot like a security. So is there a way of taking a single cryptocurrency and categorizing it very cleanly as one of these three? Or does it actually blend multiple aspects of the law in a way that you can't really regulate one thing as, you know, all money, a security and a commodity at the same time. So do we need some new sort of regulation here? Or is there a way of fitting this in? Stable coins, again, uh, I'll go very quickly over it because I talked a bit about them. But uh, what came to mind was very much Libra and how the US government accused them of shadow banking. Obviously, when you look at it very black and white, what Libra was doing in tying up US dollars to create, you know, their equivalent digital version was shadow banking. You're kind of taking a a financial system, tying it up and creating digital version of it. But that wasn't really the intention. That's not really what the technology is trying to do. The technology is trying to do is to make it easier to transfer US dollars on Facebook, on Instagram, on social media. So is there a way of fitting that into existing laws or do we need to rewrite the laws completely to actually leverage this technology? Smart contracts, I put put a question mark after records of ownership because, you know, what exactly are smart contracts? At the end of the day, if you have a smart contract and you disagree a year down the line, you go to court, how is that going to play out? Like, are they going to recognize a smart contract? Are they going to be able to recognize the code? Like, will, will lawyers be able to understand what the code was meant to do? Uh, will they have to look at the intention of what you in- intended to do? Uh, you know, there's a lot of questions about how are these going to be enforced and do they fit cleanly under existing laws or do we need new laws that will actually help to integrate this into society. Finally, we have security. So this question of how do we keep people safe? How do we keep the country safe? We've seen with stuff like DAOs that Bitcoin and blockchain technology as a whole, the idea of decentralization and democratization and using it for a collective purpose where the majority of people can determine the way that the blockchain moves is very unique. And it's something that you can't do with the US dollar. I know in theory, we vote in the government and they control it. But in reality, if 51% of people in a country want something, it doesn't necessarily mean it happens. On a blockchain, it's far easier to have a vote and to have the blockchain move in the direction that the majority wants. This is a technology we could use for our own modern democracies. Voting turnout is very low. We could potentially move towards a blockchain-based voting system, uh, but is that secure? We know in 2016 there was you know, Russian interference in elections. Would moving to an online system be more secure? Would having a blockchain-based online voting system be more secure? Uh, these are questions that the White House is grappling with. It's questions that a lot of countries around the world are grappling with. Like, 
how do we improve our election quality and how do we use technology to do that? Uh, and this is this is one technology that is often not mentioned in that conversation, but does really have a vital application. Virtual identities is another one. So I'm in British Columbia. I live in Vancouver. And we have what's called a BCEID. So I go to the, our equivalent of a DMV. I get my social card and I get my driver's license. And if I want to use my phone to access the services of the government instead of having to go back into the DMV every time, I can actually sign up for what's called a BCEID. So I have to go on a video call, answer some security questions, send them pictures of my, ver my, my physical IDs, uh, and then they verify my, my face on, on the video call. And from then on, I can use my phone to access all these services. The blockchain would make that a lot simpler. From birth, you could have a private key or you could have your own virtual identity and you could go throughout your whole life using that virtual identity online instead of needing to rely on physical government IDs or relying on you know, the BCE ID, which is just an internal database that the government holds. But at the same time, you have questions of, you know, what if someone's able to enter a false ID at birth and in 20 years you've got this fake person living? Uh, you know, what, what are the security implications of relying on the blockchain as your be all end all for identifications? Central bank digital currencies bring up similar issues of privacy. If the government's controlling the currency, we know with Bitcoin that it's a, a public ledger and that everyone can see all the transactions and how much money's in each wallet. Even if, you know, the, the CBDC's ledger wasn't completely public, is there a chance that the Federal Reserve, for example, would be able to see who owns how much money and what wallets have what amount of money and where it's moving and where it's going. Uh, is, and is that something we want? Do we want that level of privacy? Uh, land registry, again, getting into records of ownership and how to use the technology to track what is happening in the real world. Uh, you know, In Africa, there's a few examples of land registry being used and blockchain being used to recreate land registry because they had very poor systems of record keeping. In reality, in a lot of those cases, what happened was the people with the most access to technology, the most access to resources, when those land registries were being created, ended up claiming that they owned a lot of land and poor people who couldn't actually substantiate their claims or didn't know how the technology worked were unable to prove that they actually physically were located on the land and for generations had been and were legally taken, you know, their land was taken away from them. So... While that solves the theoretical problem in future of keeping records, in the short term, it actually displaced you know, many people who were unable to access the technology in the first instance. So there's a lot of questions here about security. And I think the United States especially has been very proactive in having uh, national security at the forefront of the way that they go about regulating cryptocurrencies, the way that they go about analyzing the blockchain technology as a whole. Uh, but at the end of the day, these are three things that I think everyone really does need to keep in mind, which is innovation, integration, security. So when you're approaching a problem in the area of blockchain and law, think about, you know, will a regulation in this space, what type of regulation in this space will allow innovation to continue? Think about integration. Can this technology be integrated into existing laws or do we need new laws? And then think about security. When we go about regulating, are we protecting people? Are we protecting national security? If we let this fly, so if we take the approach that potentially Portugal or Germany have of just giving it a few years to see what happens, is that potentially going to harm individuals? Is that going to harm the country? So I hope that this provides a really good baseline for everyone to sort of contextualize the conversations moving forward. And even after this conversation, to really change the way that you might think and approach questions about blockchain and the law. Uh, just, just these three words are things I would keep in mind. Just innovation, integration, security. If you keep that in mind, I think you'll be able to approach the issues in the same way that a lot of lawyers and policymakers will be approaching them in the coming months. For anyone who does have more questions, I know people have been following newsletters and reaching out. Uh, obviously, at the end of this session, we'll have the Q&A and you can reach out then. If not, you can feel free to reach out personally. Uh, and I'm sure we can share this personal information later or it has been in newsletters for those who've been following those. But at the end of the day, just keep those three words in mind. And I think that'll really help you guys. Yeah, I guess uh, the audience can search Liam Gill on Twitter and find your DMs. Yeah, Liam? Yeah, if you want to just go on Twitter, it's Lawyer Liam. Very easy to remember. <laughs> nice. Um, that was an excellent overview. I know the audience 
and myself appreciate simplifying this very big picture that we have concerning blockchain and the law to these key points. And um, Liam will join us again um, in about a half hour or so when we have a group conversation with Tony and Brian as well. Mm -hmm.